At the beginning of this year, I made two New Year's resolutions regarding my YouTube channel. I resolved to finally make videos on two highly requested subjects, one being a manga series and the other being a video game. These two series have been recommended to me for the past three or four years, mainly because they are heavily influenced by Jungian psychology, a subject that I am passionate about as evidenced by how many times I reference Carl Jung's work in my videos. Back in January, January, I concluded one half of this resolution when I finally did a video on the manga series Berserk. Up until now, however, I had yet to do a video on the other subject, that being the Japanese video game series known as Persona. It has taken me this long for two core reasons. One, up until recently, I still had a distaste for turn-based RPGs. And two, the Persona games take longer to get through than a Tolstoy novel. I wanted to wait until I completed a Persona game in its entirety before I did a video on it. But given the current circumstances of my life, the likelihood that I would finish a Persona game before the end of the year seemed unlikely. So far, I've played 10 hours of Persona 4 and 30 hours of Persona 5. And from what I understand, both games contain about 100 hours of content. When I consider that fact, along with what other people have hinted to me about what's to come, there will be too much content for me to analyze in just one video per game. Instead, I will play the Persona games when I find time to do so, then I will report back to all of you every once in a while with a new video. For the first video in this new series, I will, of course, present my thoughts on the game's use of Carl Jung's concepts, but in addition, I will be talking about one or two things that I don't think very many people have noticed regarding the game's mythology. First of all, these games are fantastic. They are joyously addictive to play. Plus, aside from the Silent Hill series, I think the Persona games probably serve as the best example of video games borrowing from psychoanalytic concepts. Though I will say that is not because their presentation of these concepts is 100% accurate. Rather, the creators of these games seemed to take concepts created by people like Carl Jung and mold them to their own purposes. The existence and function of personas demonstrate this best. According to Jung, a persona is a kind of mask, designed on the one hand to make a definite impression upon others, and on the other to conceal the true nature of the individual. In part, Persona 5 accurately depicted Jung's conception of persona by taking the mask metaphor and giving it literal form. The protagonists used their masks as a summoning mechanism for their personas, beings that they describe as their other selves. In one way, this is also accurate because a persona, as Jung just defined, is a form of oneself that we project out into the world. Personas are not our actual selves, because if they were, our personas would contain all the negative aspects of our personality along with the positive. We tend to hide those negative aspects in our shadow, which we'll get to in a moment. No, personas are the idealized versions of ourselves that we want people to see us as. Kind of like a dating profile. We wear this metaphorical mask known as the persona all the time in order to get along in a society. This fact contradicts something that Morgana says in Persona 5, that the persona is the true feelings of your heart, when in fact it's a bit more complicated than that. Sometimes your persona is an accurate reflection of your heart, but sometimes it's not. More often than not, it's a mixture of things that accurately and inaccurately reflect your true behavior. Nonetheless, it's almost always an idealized depiction of your personality. Now onto the shadow concept. Once again, we see accuracies and inaccuracies. The shadow is the dark side of one's personality. It contains all the aspects of one's personality that are incommensurate with things like the persona or one's conscious self, what Jung and Freud would refer to as the ego. In the persona games, the shadow is creatively personified in several beings that live in the metaverse. Like in real life, the people in the persona games are almost always ignorant of their shadow. They don't 
some want to acknowledge this dark side of their personality, that they are capable of the most repulsive, violent behaviors. However, Jung said that in order to become a truly moral, authentic individual, one must become conscious of their shadow side and integrate it, bring it under your control. That way, the shadow doesn't loom over you and direct your behavior, like we see in the case of people like Kamashita and Madarame in Persona 5. Instead, you loom over the shadow. But again, for the sake of simplicity and storytelling, the creators of Persona took creative liberties with the shadow concept. For example, the games depict the shadow as a purely evil being that needs to be vanquished. But according to Jung, the shadow wasn't purely negative. Very often, the shadow contains positive things that need to become a part of one's conscious personality. Say that you're a closeted homosexual and you have been repressing this fact all your life, but doing so has caused you serious psychological harm. If you consult your shadow, you can integrate the suppressed part of your personality and become a healthier person for it. Or, to use a more universal example, say you need to study hard in university to become a good student but you procrastinate a lot. In order to become a good student, you have to confront the part of you that tends towards procrastination and embrace new, productive study habits. These positive and negative traits all exist within the shadow. Another thing that the Persona games didn't convey was the fact that the shadow never actually disappears. Shadows can't be vanquished like our protagonists so often do in these games. Shadows are always there, and we must come to terms with that fact even if we don't like it. Just like somebody who is afraid of the dark must come to terms with the fact that light cannot exist without darkness to define it. In Jung's mind, your conscious self, your ego, is in constant dialogue with your shadow as long as you live. If this dialogue were to ever reach a definitive end, the ego would evolve into what Jung called the self also known as the true self, or the Jungian self. This self would be the balance between the conscious ego and the unconscious shadow, the harmony of light and darkness. Every human being strives towards the Jungian self throughout their lives. It is the ideal self that various cultures throughout the world have symbolized through religious imagery. For example, Jesus Christ is a symbol of the Jungian self because he, in the minds of Christians, was the ideal man. So Christians use Jesus Christ as a positive example to help guide them towards their own Jungian selves. I am bringing up this connection between the Jungian self and gods for a reason, but I'll explain why in a few minutes. Of all the Jungian concepts that Persona depicts, I think its presentation of the unconscious is the most accurate and also the most creative. In Jungian psychology, the unconscious is a two-sided psychic force. On the one hand, there's the personal unconscious where human beings store things like their memories. On the other hand, there is the collective unconscious, which is a force that binds all human beings together. It is the collective unconscious that instills human beings with the same psychic patterns, things like instincts. For instance, an infant is instinctually driven to drink their mother's milk soon after they are born. They weren't taught this. They were born with this instinct. The source of this instinct is abstractly formulated by Jung as the collective unconscious. Like we saw in regards to the persona and shadow concepts, the personal and collective unconscious are given physical form. This tendency for mental concepts to take physical form is derivative of another Jungian concept known as synchronicity, but I've talked about that ad nauseum on this channel. Anyways, in Persona 5, a person's personal unconscious takes the form of a palace. The personal nature of the unconscious is exemplified by the decorations of these palaces. For example, Kaneshiro, the mafia boss who loves money, has his palace decorated much like a bank vault, with money and piggy banks laying everywhere. In regards to the collective unconscious, this is personified in the form of mementos. Because of its collective nature, there's nothing that makes it unique. That's why the various levels all pretty much look the same. The only thing that differs are the monsters that inhabit it. Now, isn't it interesting that these monsters that can become your personas are also referred to as demons, and that they also reside in the collective unconscious? 
This isn't by accident. If the collective unconscious is responsible for instilling thought forms, things like instincts within you at birth, it is also responsible for instilling demons. Now, in real life, we don't have actual demons residing within us, at least none that we can objectively prove. But what people have done in the past, before the advent of modern psychology and medicine, is refer to their mental issues, their psychological baggage, as demons. Persona's use of demons is an offshoot of that notion. They originate within the collective unconscious, travel to our personal unconscious, and try to bend us to their will. One final thing that I'd like to point to before I conclude this video is the Jungian concept of archetypes. Like instincts and demons, they are produced by and reside in the collective unconscious. Archetypes are the foundation of not only the human psyche, but of all life in general. They are universal patterns. The best example of an archetype would be that of a mother and father. All human beings, and much of life in general, sprang from the intercourse of a mother and father. Therefore, mothers and fathers are archetypes of the collective unconscious. Of all the archetypes that Jung discussed in his works, arguably the most important archetype that he discussed was the one I referenced before, the self. All human beings are unconsciously programmed to strive to greater personal heights, to higher development, and the pinnacle of that development is the Jungian self. As I said before, one of the most famous symbols of the self is Jesus Christ, but various other religions around the world have tried to give form to the same underlying archetype using their own symbols. Buddhists, for example, use Buddha as a symbol of the self. For Hindus, it's the concept of Brahman. For Jews, it's Yahweh. In simpler terms, Jung viewed the highest god in these religions as formulations of the unconscious self. For the purposes of this video, I'd like to draw attention to one religious tradition that many of you might not be familiar with, and their depictions of a certain divinity. That tradition is known as Gnosticism. In Gnostic tradition, the creator of the world is known by many names. Two of the most prominent names are Demiurge and Yaldabaoth. I think that's how you pronounce that. This creator was an ignorant god, one that sprang forth from a realm that is seen as higher than the collective unconscious, one that is known as the Pleroma. The Demiurge, slash Yaldabaoth, was unaware of his descent from a higher, more divine plane. Moreover, he was unconscious of the fact that, unlike the beings of the Pleroma, he was an imperfect god. Seeing that he figured he was the highest being, he used the power bestowed to him as a god from the Pleroma to create the world. Because the Demiurge was imperfect and fallible, the world he created reflected that imperfection, what with all its suffering and malevolence. The Gnostics wished to transcend the rule of the Demiurge so they may reach the higher plane of the Pleroma. Their way of doing this was through a process known as Gnosis. Carl Jung was particularly interested in the Gnostics because their process of Gnosis reflected his own process known as individuation. Individuation was that process I described before where one confronted their own shadow so that their ego may transform into the Jungian self, and thus take on a nature much like that of a god. Now I bring all this up because, unfortunately, I've had aspects of Persona spoiled for me, and one of those aspects is the existence of a character known as the Demiurge, or Yaldabaoth. From what I understand, Yaldabaoth, or the Demiurge, is the ruler of Mementos, much like the Gnostic Demiurge was the creator of the world and the collective unconscious that binds it. The wiki for Persona 5 describes him as, supposedly, the treasure of Mementos, which lines up well with my commentary on the Jungian self being the highest archetype. I anticipate that at some point towards the end of the game, the characters will confront Yaldabaoth and have the opportunity to transcend him, completing their own individuation processes, achieving their Jungian selves, and becoming like gods in the eyes of the masses. But I'll have to see. I do have more to say on the subject of archetypes, particularly how the game makes greater use of them in regards to the use of the Tarot Arcana, but that will have to wait until my next video. 
Until then, please make sure to hit that like button. It's totally free and it helps me out tremendously with the YouTube algorithm. Also, if you want to support the work I am doing here, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Doing so will help me continue to promote the academic value of video games, and also uncover secrets that you won't find in any other game theory video or Reddit post. It will also help me continue this channel's secondary function, which is the promotion and discussion of proper mental health. I'll leave a link to my Patreon in the description box below. Until my next video, just remember, as always, stay yellow.